Wow. It's the start of a brand new season, high school basketball. We are excited. We're ready to get going. What are we doing, though? We're looking at plays. How many plays? Five plays. Stick around. Greetings, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Five Play Friday. My name is Greg Austin with a better official. We craft video to help basketball officials get better and take control of their officiating career. One of the ways we do that is we look at plays. Look at plays. Look at all of the things so that we can get better as basketball officials. As we like to do with our show, as we start the show with a You Make the Call play. What do you have on this play? All right, player runs out of bounds. What do you have? What's your ruling? On this play, put your ruling down in the comments below and stick around to the end of the video where we'll talk about all of the things on play number one. All right, with that, let's go to play number two. Supposed to tip off at 7.30. Another free throw miss. Another rebound for Reardon, and Hillman hits the deck after grabbing the board. All right, we have a prone player lying on the floor, right? Opponent trips over that player, calling official rules of foul. Of course, we know that in the past, the and, and currently, any player who has a spot on the floor is entitled to that spot. That is a fundamental concept of playing basketball. Right? Players are entitled to their spot on the floor as long as they got there first. But new this year, we have clarification, a case play that said that clarifies that a player laying on the floor is liable for contact in this situation. So this is a blocking foul by rule supported by case play in 24-25. Previously, there was a case play that said this would be a traveling violation. That case play disappeared from the case book for a number of years. There was confusion about it. I mean, how is a new official supposed to know this would not be? But there is clarification this year that this is a blocking foul by rule, that even though this player was prone on the floor, entitled to their spot on the floor, that in this instance, that player lying on the floor is liable for the contact. So it's great to have that clarification from National Federation of High School. This is now a blocking foul. Now, many officials have been calling it a blocking foul um, because it's obviously not legal. <laughs> and so our calling official here, even though this was a couple of years ago, he said, hmm, sometime in the future, they're going to change the rule. Yeah, that's what he said. All right, next play. Okay, there's flopping going on. Set a timer, five minutes. <laughs> All right, obviously this year, new rules about faking being fouled puts us in a position of making judgments about whether players are intentionally overtly embellishing contact, making theatrical movements in an effort to fool the officials into ruling a foul. Right. So if we look at this play, there are several things. Uh, one involves uniforms. One involves a prone player on the floor. 
etc. But if we take a look at the play itself, right? So players, you know, we have an airborne player. We have a pass crash situation, potentially. Um, we have a player who has established a legal position on the floor prior to the player going airborne. The player lands. And we notice that the action of our defensive player here, right? So our judgment here has to be, did the contact by the player, is it, does it rise to the level of a foul or is it incidental contact? And if a defender embellishes incidental contact to get the official to call a foul, they are guilty of flopping, right? So we notice the action of this player. Did the contact by the offensive player cause this player's knees to buckle and for them to move in a downward direction? No. No, that, no, it did not, right? They had put themselves in a position, a legal position. The contact, though, did not cause this action. This player is trying to get the official to rule a foul in this instance. Hello, Oliver. So the player Good sits impression. down, basically, right? And then we have a subsequent play. Hello, I'm sorry. I scared you with my voice. Right? That could be ruled a foul. That could be ruled a f uh, not a flop. The player didn't flop in this, but there may have been pressure from behind. So there's a lot going on on this play. We've got our coaches jumping up and down, you know, this, that, and the other thing, something to be addressed on the play, right? So in my judgment, this is a flopping action by this defensive player. Simply because there's the basic fundamental here is, did the contact cause the result? Or the, did the defender exhibit behavior that was overtly embellishing the contact? Now, what would we do in this instance? Our guidance is to immediately indicate flopping, and allow the play to continue. At this point, the ball had come dead. We would either assess a warning, a team warning for flopping, based on the action of that player, and then we would go on. If a warning had already been issued, uh, subsequently a technical foul would be assessed. So... We got flopping going on. Now, uh, who just shot the ball? What is his number? You can't see his number. Hmm. Yeah, so a few years ago, National Federation of High School changed the rule, the uniform rule. Has to be a contrasting color for the numerals. It goes into effect this year. If these would be illegal uniforms by rule, penalty for illegal uniforms, direct technical foul to the head coach prior to the game or when discovered. Also, here we have our prone player on the floor. If that player, if there was illegal contact, that would be a foul on the play. Okay, so there's a lot going on there. Obviously, the coaching behavior in this situation needs to be addressed in some fashion. So, flopping. It's in our laps. We're going to have a lot of disagreements. You might say, that's a charge. That's a charge. Illegal contact knocked him down, right? As a crew, we have to have consistency. That's the only thing we can really hope for, right? And it's an association. Are we going to have consistency in judgment about flopping plays? It's going to be a real, real challenge. But we love a challenge, and we're moving on. Well, now, what do we have on this play, right? So we have a ball handler dribbler who extends a forearm. And again, ask yourself, does the contact, which could be deemed incidental, cause the action of the defensive player? Or is the defensive player overtly embellishing the contact so that the official will call a foul, right? This is an egregious example of overtly embellishing the contact. 
right? So our ball handler dribbler extends a forearm, right? Does the forearm cause that result on the player, right? This player is a fool the ref player. He utilize right. So if we know we know what he does in this instance, right? He's throwing his head back. This is a, an attempt to fool the official into calling a foul. That's the bottom line. When a player throws their head back upon contact in this situation, they are faking that they have been fouled. They are faking that this action caused their head to go back. So in this instance. If the officials deemed this to be faking being fouled, they would withhold their whistle, immediately give the indication of flopping, and allow the play to continue. So, More flopping. Flopping is, in the, is going to be a huge point of emphasis this year, and this is another example of it. And it just if we just take our takeaways on this play, throwing the head back, right? That is an intentional act by a defensive player not related to the contact. And in doing so, you know, the flailing, right? This is the theatrical movements involved on a play like this. Okay, flopping, flopping. What else do we have to look at? Let's take a look at our next play. He has six along with seven assists. (laughs) Flipping shots up. Bank shot. That was a right way out of glass. Three pointer off the glass shot. Right way out of glass. Kentucky's premier out of glass provider. And we've got a little bit of words going on between the two teams. What did you see, Minor? Well, it looked like one player pushed a a a, a Lyon County player shoved an Adair County player, and the Adair County coach ran out on the floor. Didn't look pretty there for a second. Good Referees. job. See if we can get it sorted out. Carl Nathan looking over. Carl, what, what do you have here? All right, they've got a double technical, number 22 for Lyon County. Shoulders. And number four for Adair County. That's white. Offsetting the possession arrow is what is going to determine who has the ball and looks like it's going to be Lyon County. So nothing on, on the bench either way. Okay. Okay, uh, important to recognize in this situation that the ball is dead, right? Um, and so these actions that occur in this setting are dead ball situations, right? So what do we have on the play? First of all, the blue player, right? So the white player goes to take the ball out of bounds. The blue player is holding their arm. White player, as a retaliatory action, takes the basketball and shoves it into the face of the opponent who's holding them. This would appropriately be ruled. Right? White takes a little bit of contact, a little knee to the back of the head, bump, hold, basketball to the face. Right? If we assess double technical fouls on these two players, right? One is dead ball contact. The other, to me, is clearly flagrant. That's a flagrant action by the player with the basketball. Intent to harm, right? And we can come out of the situation where it is a double technical. We have a unsportsmanlike technical and we have a flagrant technical in this situation. What does our crew do? They send the teams to their benches. They're going to get together to talk it. They talk it through, talk it through. They have everything answered. 
The announcers say they come out with a possession arrow throw in. That would not be correct. We don't know that that's the case. It would be a point of interruption. If we rule a double tactical foul on those two players, we would go to the point of interruption. What is the point of interruption? Team B has just scored. Team A gets an end line throw in along the end line. That would be how we resume. So an end of game situation, or not an end of game, but, but the game is decided. Tempers flare. Actions by the players, to me, that simply rises to the level of player technical and flagrant player technical in that situation. Yeah, let's take a look at another one. Here we go. Next play. A ball thrown from beyond the three-point arc contacts a defender inside the three-point arc. The ball ricochets up and goes in the basket. How many points do we rule in this situation? By rule, for a thrown ball beyond the three-point arc, thrown clearly as a pass, deflected by a opponent inside the arc the ball goes in the basket by rule three points are scored national federation of high school basketball rules <clears throat> he is throwing a pass to a cutting player could have been an alley-oop pass can't tell ball goes in the basket by rule three points national federation of high school basketball rules we're sticking by it i know there's some noise about that says, oh, there's clarification. By rule, by my reading of the rule, this is a three-point goal. What do you have? Put it in the comments down below. What have we had today? Flopping, flagrant fouls. Is there a palate cleanser in our future? We know that leaving the court voluntarily and returning and being the first to touch the ball is a ruling. Let's look at the classic the classic play scenario really amplifies this fact. This was a crazy one. Watch the team in white and pay particular attention to this guy right here, who's about to leave the screen. In fact, not only did he leave the screen, but he also left the gymnasium. His defender here has no idea where he went, but the point guard knows exactly where he is. He's out in the hallway, getting ready to run around through the side door. He gets the pass and buries the three-pointer, just like they planned it. So, you got to give these players their props, right? For thinking of this, it's a fun thing. And our point guard... Throws the ball when the kid is still in the hallway. That's pretty elite. That's pretty elite, right? I guess he sees him cut through there, and he's not looking. He threw the ball, and the kid was not visible. That's impressive. That's impressive. So this would be a what's considered to be a violation of leaving the court intentionally and being the first to touch the ball on returning. Yeah. Yes, it would. Hey, back at the start of the show, we had a You Make the Call play. What do you have on this play? Let's look back on play number one. Our player on the wing here runs off of the court, utilizes a screen on the far side, comes up top, and is the first to touch the ball. The ball handler, what did you have on this play? By rule, in the past, 
a player who voluntarily leaves the court and is then the first to touch the ball upon returning to the court is a violation. But new this year, in 2024-25, this play is deemed to be legal. Case play says that this player who leaves the court to gain an advantage and does so momentarily, if their defender in this situation is allowed time to recover and play defense and the advantage that they gained by running off of the court has gone away, that then they can be the first or the next to touch the basketball in this scenario. So case play 24-25 dictates that this is a legal play. This player has voluntarily left the court. We have a new signal, of course, where we would extend an arm when the player voluntarily leaves the court. Um, when they f- return to the court and are next to touch, in this instance, since the defender had been allowed to recover, this is a legal play and not violation by rule. The, the timing of the play on this play is there's a significant delay. Let's say that instead of this player going away here, that they immediately pass the ball to the player who cuts here. This defender, right, who was disadvantaged when the player went out of bounds, is no longer disadvantaged. They have recovered. They are playing defense. So if the pass had immediately gone to this player and the defender had recovered, this would still be a legal play. So some clarity, play situations such as this, the player voluntarily leaves the court. They are at risk for a violation. But if the advantage that they gained dissipates by the defender no longer being disadvantaged, then this is a legal play. Hey, thanks for joining the show today. Much appreciated. Much love. We'll see you in the next one. Take care, everybody. Everybody.